More and more, what people are building is uh, single page applications. In the uh, security server, we made our admin UI as a single page application, and it's it's super great. I mean, now everything that you can do in the UI, you can do through the API. So doesn't doesn't matter anything, and that's really important for many of our customers because they want to use that API directly and integrate it into their management systems and their um, uh, security operation center. So it's a really cool way of building apps. Uh, and we'll talk about a couple of ways to do that using the implicit flow before we talked about the code flow. Uh, so we'll talk about that and we'll also talk about the assisted token flow. Uh, and we'll talk about server to server flow that uses uh, the client credential grant type. And then uh, we'll touch on some other sort of related flows. Sound all right? Postman coming. So uh, we'll see some HTTP. Hold out for that or run uh, now. <laughs> so first of all, we'll do the implicit flow. What does this mean? So before I talk to you guys about how what's super great about OAuth is that we authenticate the user and we authenticate the client. But when the client is uh, some single page application, all of its code is viewable by right clicking and viewing source. So what's the point of authenticating it, right? You can just look in that code and shoot it over and so it's meaningless. So why bother? Why do that extra hop around stuff? So the implicit flow is we just implicitly authenticate the client. Um, so the way this works is, as before, client will ask the authorization server for a token, asks in a slightly different way to say, hey, by the way, I want to interact with you this way, uh, not the other way. And user will have to authenticate by hook or by crook in other words, like any way it wants to. And then immediately it will get back the token, not that one-time access code. Okay? Make sense? Let's see that. So it will make a little bit more sense. Hopefully I won't run into PowerPoint problems. No? Good. Great. So let me copy and paste a URL. Got it. So I'm going to hit this. But let's talk about what it is. Can you see that a little bit? So I have a OAuth server running on localhost 8443. And I'm going to call the authorize endpoint. And in that, I'm going to have a response type equal token. And that means do the implicit flow. Uh, and here I said, like, remember, we're going to implicitly authenticate the client uh, by just identifying it. So it's client one. Uh, we think, right? I mean, I can. anyone can make this request. And I'm going to ask for a couple scopes, read and write. So let's, let's do that. SSO, and I'm back. So now I have this uh, access token, but let's clear my session. And then you can see that whole thing from the PowerPoint. So now I have to log in, right, because I'm not logged in. So I'll select that authentication method that checks me against some database. And now I have a code here, or a token, sorry. So what's happening here is that this token is coming back on the fragment, right? So the browser, it did not post that up to the server. Um, HTTP says the fragment part is for the user agent, not for the server. So even when I request this callback at this client, the user agent shouldn't, at least, send this part. So only the JavaScript now has this uh, access token. And it tells the JavaScript client a little bit, like this is a bearer token, and you can keep it for this long. And you asked for those scopes, and you got those scopes. OK? So this is that uh, reference token type that I talked about. Um, so what I would do is I would call the API at this point. And the API then would need to, whoop, not that one, would need to introspect it. So let's just look inside there a little. So I'm going to call the OAuth server, and I'm going to introspect this. So now the API knows that it was John Doe. It was very fast, but I think you guys might have noticed that that's who I logged in as. It's an access token. 
the one who issued this access token uh, is my computer called Spruce. Um, and the token type is bear, and this is the client. Um, this token is for two different services or audiences, and there you have that read and write scope. So the API doesn't have to believe the client, like you have these rights or these rights were delegated to you. It's encoded in the token, and the API can introspect that and find that out, that the user really did delegate those rights to this particular client name, client one. And uh, this lasts for a little while, expiration, issue debt, stuff like that. Questions? Delegation ID. So the delegation ID is like when the user delegated his or her rights to this application, there was a delegation created. And in that you could store all sorts of different things if you wanted to, like, um, yeah how many times they should be able to refresh it, or uh, how long you want that to be slid out, or things like that. That's a implementation-specific thing related to Curity, because this server is running Curity. Other questions? Implicit flow. OK, so now you have some, some work to do. you got to write some JavaScript to like, you know, do that flow, put those things together right, and, and uh, all of that. And a lot of times with single page application, there's sort of like this pattern that you go through. Like, okay, you got the token, now where do you put it? Local storage cookie. Um, like F5 needs to work, so we gotta stick it somewhere. And everyone wants to frame it. I mean, we saw an example of the login being framed. How do you frame that securely and just work? And uh, SSO and all that should just function in that framed environment and you just want to have an XHR client to just make API calls, right? That's what this whole thing is about. So why don't we instead use a different flow for with our JavaScript client called the assisted token flow? Very similar to the previous flow where the uh, client itself isn't authenticated but what's very different is the way we exchange the tokens. So instead of exchanging the token through that fragment, we'll use post message. So we'll actually create a dynamic iframe, because everyone wants to log in in frames, uh, so you don't lose context, it's important. So we'll create a dynamic iframe, and in that, if we have that cookie with the token in it, we close that and the user's logged in and we can start to make our API calls. If the user isn't yet logged in in that, f that dynamic iframe, we need to break out of there and do a window open to show them a login form, okay? So this dynamic iframe then will check with the server, okay, here, I'd like to get logged in, and in that flow, we'll go a uh, cookie header. So the access code is actually locked down to the server, not even to the client. So the client doesn't need to keep it in local storage or in um, in a cookie, it keeps it in the server's path and the server's domain. And as a result, if that token has been revoked at the next login request, at the next uh, time you try to make an API call, it can check with the server to see if that's been revoked. If it has, or if the user doesn't yet have a token, we can, we can break out of that and do window.open to show them a, a, a login screen, okay? And then, after all of that, we'll issue a token in that dynamic iframe uh, or in the window that we opened. And we will do a post message from that origin to the one that's framing it. What's super great about this is that post message has support in the browser to make sure that we're not sending the token to someone we don't know or trust. And the browser will actually enforce that. Whereas with redirects and other flows, the browser will happily follow along to wherever. And the number one attack in OAuth is redirecting codes and tokens to malicious attackers. So by using post message, we utilize browser technology to close that, that vulnerability. So let's look at that. Here I got my single page application. And what I do is, can you see that? A little bit bigger maybe? 
that better? Um, right here, I load some JavaScript from the OAuth server. So I say, here's my OAuth server you saw before. Grab the assisted token endpoint. I'm going to pull down a minified version of the assisted token JavaScript library. And then that's going to give me an object. Curity.token, which has a method called assistant where I pass in a, a settings. Look at my settings, guys. This is so killer. One setting, which is the client. If I'm using jQuery, I can say like, yes, prepend the access token to all APIs that match this, this regex. But now it's super simple. You can't really get that wrong. It's just like, I am this client. And what you get back then is that assistant object. And when the document is ready, then what you do is you say, um, in ex this example, I want to say fetch tokens, and then I want to do something with those tokens. See that? So assistant gives me the the access uh, to the header with the authorization uh, already in it, the token and the authorization header, um, or if I use that setting, it will immediately be wired up and I can just start using $.get or whatever. Okay, makes a little bit of sense. Let me show you this. Maybe it'll make even more sense. I think I'd close this window. So here's that HTML running that SPA and I can say get tokens and I'm logged in. So I immediately get them with the SSO. So let me just uh, log out so you can see the whole thing. So now I'm logged out and I get tokens and it sees you didn't have a token. So I need to break out of the, the dynamic frame and do window.open and now I log in and the result is going to be post messaged back to the, the framer and the framer has that access token. Is that too small? Does that make sense? Okay, so that's super great. Uh, but now like you're about to do some transaction. We want to know that you still possess this identity. We want to force the user to uh, log in again and maybe give them some information about um, the transaction that they're about to do. So let's ignore any SSO cookie um, that might be there. And now I'm forced to log in again anew. And I have a new access token here, 4D. And this one was 3C. So if I get this again, this one allows for SSO, so it takes that, that new one. If I do it again, I just keep getting the old, old one. This doesn't even contact the authentication service to log me in. It just grabs the cookie and reissues it. Uh, and then I can make API calls. Um, so this does like stuff with, uh, like Aspen was talking about, cross-origin. So this API would allow that and be able to use jQuery. We can look at that. That was what? Example 4. So here I am, I just call on ready, I click the button, and then I got my excess jar and I can use it to make this, this get. I mean, that's, that's pretty simple stuff. I mean, all of the authentication, bank ID, SMS, account linking, all that mumbo jumbo, you don't even think or know about it. You just do some JavaScript and you're done. So OAuth doesn't have to be at all hard. And uh, for single page applications, all of those things uh, around cookies and tokens and stuff, um, you can do those using the assisted token flow automatically. Questions on that SPA integration model? Got it? Makes some sense? Great. Okay, how am I doing on time? I'm fine, super. So sometimes there is no user. Sometimes there's just a server. Let's talk about when there is a server and when there really is a user. Because that single page application has no, has no capability except calling an API. And that API is on a server. Is that the server I'm talking about? 
because there a user is in play. Even if that API is on a server, and even if that one calls another API and another API and another API, all throughout that chain, we want to know on the front end who that user is in each link of the chain so that it can make authorization decisions. If we call from the SPA into the API and the API just gets its own access token and calls the next one, then it doesn't have the, the back end one, the really far back end one, doesn't know anything about the user. And we, we've learned from building systems and end tier architectures and so and all that stuff that that puts us into a dead end in many, many use cases. So when doing server to server communication, that's not the server to server communication I mean. When there is a user on the front end, we want to propagate that identity all the way through those different API calls. The only time we're going to do something like server to server is when it really is disconnected, like batch processing, clearing payments at 2 a.m., something like that, um, where it, it is really just a computer program calling another computer program. Does that distinction make sense? Super important. Don't do server to server in your API. Um, but now we have this headless server. How does this work? It requests a token to the OAuth server. So it adds different, different request parameters. It calls a different endpoint, but it's still OAuth and it's still the OAuth server that it talks to. What it gets back is a token. And that token, again, could be ref, SAML, SiteMinder, what have you, that makes sense for that server client. Okay, now the thing is that server, like we talked about in the break, does not get a refresh token. So in that, this, this is the flow, client credential it stands for, that server doesn't get a refresh token. It only gets the session. Remember the access token is like a, a session and the refresh token is like a password. So it only gets a session token. Why is that? because that password or the client credential can always be used to get a new access token. So when doing that, uh, the, the server doesn't need to refresh it. It can just refresh it using its password. And it doesn't even need to be a password. It could be a, a client certificate or something like that. Does that make sense? I'll come back to this table in a sec. Let's, let's look at this flow, because this is example hour. So here I have CC flow. So here we have Postman. Um, we're going to make a post request to the, the same OAuth server. Now we're going to use the token endpoint. So OAuth at, in the base protocol defines two endpoints. That, uh, that is the authorization endpoint and the token endpoint. So now we're getting a token, so we talk directly to that. Um, and we need to inc do www form in URL encoded, and we're going to pass in in that form uh, four parameters. One is the client credential, client ID, some client secret, and then how we want the server to respond. And in this case, we want it to respond with a token. Okay? So we just do that. And we get back a token, and we give to this client a ref token, and this token can also be introspected. So now we see that it's no longer John Doe who authenticated, but the subject, the identified entity, is the actual client, test gateway client is what I called it. Um, it's issued by the same issuer, uh, Spruce, and um, token type, bearer, client ID is this, and the, the token is meant to be used by another uh, set of services or a service called introspect and has no scopes. Questions on that? Client credential flow, server to server? Good question. So the API, you should try to keep that as simple as possible with regard to security. So if you, if you accept a, a client certificate on the API, then the API is doing security two different ways. When it's called by some clients, it does a 
access token. Other times it does a key uh, certificate. So to simplify the security model of that guy, we'll always get access tokens and we'll always present those in the same fashion. Good question. Others? Yeah? Yes. Absolutely. So if you didn't hear that, it was like, why not just send the the uh, client key to the API and authenticate with the key there? Why switch it for the access token? And it's so that you have that uniform model. Okay. Back to PowerPoint. So here I have this table. This is an important one as we look at all these flows. So we talked about code flow today, we talked about implicit flow, we talked about assisted token flow, we talked about client credential flow, and there's another one called resource owner uh, password credential flow, and actually there's like, you know, even more. Um, but for your information and knowledge, uh, you get a refresh token, that sort of renewable token, uh, ticket granting ticket in the code flow, not in the implicit flow. In the assisted flow, you don't even need it, so it's not a question. Uh, client credential flow, you don't get it, as I talked about. You have that, that uh, credential from the client that you can get a new one, so there's no point. And ROPC, uh, you, can, you can get a refresh token. So the resource owner password credential flow is when you actually accept a username and a password from the end user and then you submit that to the OAuth server and get back a token. And the reason for doing this is again, so your API has one security model, it doesn't matter if it's server to server, implicit, any of this, it's like I always want a token. And I want a token from the only security token service I trust. Okay, so this ROPC flow is legacy, like the application has to ask for the username and the password from the user, which was sort of the point of inventing OAuth. So it's meant for backward compatibility, and if you're doing greenfield development, this should be off your list. And the product owner is going to say, we need to own the user experience. Fight the powers. <laughs> Did I go to sleep? Almost. So introspection. You saw me do it a couple times. What is this? I send a token, and I get back JSON. It doesn't say what in the spec. I can do anything I want and JSON is like nesting and all this stuff. So look at this cool thing. I'll go back to Postman. And here I got my token. It might still be valid, it expires then. For those of you who have a Unix time clock in your brain, tell me, is that expired? I don't know. Uh, we'll introspect it and find out. But this time I'll call a different endpoint on the OAuth server. So on this OS server, I configured multiple introspection endpoints. One is at introspect, like you saw in the other URI, is dash JWT. So I can have a thousand introspect endpoints on my OS server if I want to. Okay, that's pretty neat. I got back something else. It's still JSON, still matches the spec, but one of the, the new properties of that map is one called JOT and it contains a bunch of gibberish. What is that gibberish? It's a JOT token. I can prove it to you by introspecting the introspection results. Oops, except I'll only introspect the JOT and not everything else. So let me do like that, let's do like that. Active false, so that one even expired on me really fast. And Actually, I think the reason it expired is because this client can't use that token. Um, but let me switch back to that other one. Aha, uh -huh. the actual token expired. So now what happens in client credential flow when your token expires? What do you do? You refresh it somehow, and how do you refresh it? Because you didn't get a refresh token in, in your client credential flow. So you refresh it by your secret. So we make a new one. See, that only lasted 300 seconds and I've already been babbling for 300 seconds. So that, and what the OAuth server has done is he's matched 
the expiration of the jot with the expiration of the refresh token. Whoa, recursive, recursive jot. <laughs> so I introspected the jot and got back the introspection results. So I can do whatever in introspection. What I will do almost always in introspection is, I don't have it here in a slide, but what I'll do is in the gateway, the gateway will do this introspection of the ref token. And it will use that ref token as a cache key into the results. And the results will be that jot token. So like we talked about before with the microservices, you're going to pass that by value token into the back so that the back end can verify that jot token by uh, using the public key of the server. And then we'll have to call introspection. So it can do a, an offline verification. I was doing online by calling introspect of that jot, but you don't need to because that jot consists of three parts. Um, maybe we can look at it good places here. So if we look for dots, somewhere is a dot. So the segments, the first part of it is telling the microservice, like it's, it's signed with this key. Then the second part is a bunch of data. And the third part is a signature. So it can just find in the header um, like which key was used and, and how to do that. OK? Questions on introspection and flip-flopping between reference token and um, by value token? This is, like I was, I was t saying uh, on the break, this is a computer science 300 level project to build a gateway that can do this flip-flopping. And the, the cache that you have of reference token to um, by value token, you can have like 10 of those, those translation services and scale them all. And you're going to get a cache miss the first time on each of those, but you can tolerate that. Uh, in each of those. So you don't have to have a shared state even amongst those those perimeter services. So do you need an API manager go and buy one for like a hundred grand or something? No. You need some sort of service that can switch it around. And that could just be, you know, a little Go service, it could be something you've written in Java. Uh, it could be any of the, the microservices as a uh, an authentication filter. Mm -hmm. Could be Zool. So as you're you're routing, you could do this conversion. Another interesting thing of that recursive uh, jots is that this could be another token for the third API in the call. So as you go, it's like inside that token, you're going to have other tokens for the next guy. Uh, it could even be like username password because I'm about to call outside of my network and I need to have a special secret uh, that the service provider gave me. So you can do some pretty sophisticated things here, all based on standards and how you use them. More questions? Revocation. I think it's probably expired because I babbled so long. Uh, but I can revoke this token, even the JOT token, if I don't include the issuer. Unauthorized client. Uh, yeah, anyway. You can revoke tokens, and what you get back is JSON so that you can. You can say through an API call, this token should no longer be useful. So we talked about different flows for single page applications, implicit and assisted token flow, highly recommend assisted token flow. Curity supports it out of the box, it makes it super simple. Uh, and then you have the client credential flow and server to server for, for server to server communication. We also talked about revoke, introspect, and ROPC a little bit. Any last questions? Yeah. Yep. Very good. Yep. So we tested it on Firefox and Chrome and uh, Safari uh, on iOS 9 and 10 and even 8, I think, um, as well as Android. Hmm? It hasn't been.
With post message, you mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Mm hmm. All right. Yeah. So the um, the the way around that uh, it tends to be more in the authentication side because you get like an SMS. Uh, the question was like switching tabs, switching apps. Then the the browser goes to sleep and saves battery, and then it comes back up and it's host. Um, and so that can happen. Like you switch over to the bank ID app, or you switch over to SMS. And then the mobile operating system says, okay, Firefox, Chrome, go to sleep. And then when... Yeah. And so when it comes back up, though, and or you switch back over to that tab, there's an event that will fire. And then you can, you can uh, activate on that. But this is not doing any polling either. Um, you might be doing polling for, like, during authentication, like, is the SMS verified? Is it SMS verified? Is the SMS verified? You might be doing that sort of thing, but then you're going to be switching over to the SMS app and back to the browser, and then it's going to catch that event, pull it again, come back, and then do the whole post message thing after. Sure. Um, Curity.io. So it's not a standard flow uh, as of yet. We're joining we joined the OpenID Foundation yesterday and uh, we will work with the IETF to make it a standard. Uh, Nat Sakamura, the editor of um, OpenID Connect, has a somewhat similar draft of something like this and our ambition is to uh, combine what it is that they've been working on with uh, assisted token flow so that it's a bona fide standard. Nope, no other name. That's the name. Yeah, so the, I think that um, Nat Sakamura's draft goes by something like, I don't, I don't remember. Um, yeah. Other questions? Super de duper de. Yep. How do you do single sign on between different applications? So let's let's look here at the network tab. SSO is not a thing for the OAuth server to do because authentication is not something a part of OAuth. Um, authentication is something to be done by an authentication service, which I happen to be running on the exact same computer in the same port because. Uh, my security server is also an authentication service. But in this request then, from because if you see here, I did a, a post to the assisted token endpoint here, and it said, okay, super duper, but get yourself logged in by talking to my authentication service. And in the request headers, which I can't see because this thing is gigantic, there it is. In the request header, what is flowing? No, not that one. This one. Okay, so here we did login. So now this one will have in the request header a cookie. Oh yeah, it was in the other one too. I just wasn't looking right here. See how the cookie that flowed up? One of them is called auth SSO blah. That's my SSO cookie with the authentication service. So now if I do like 100 of these assisted token clients or like a website that's doing code flow or implicit flow or whatever, it's always going to talk to the authentication service to get itself logged in, and there the cookie will flow. And what's super cool about this now is we've been talking about APIs all day, and we love APIs, but sometimes users just want to log into websites like Salesforce or OpenID Connect or... Um, um, Salesforce or Office 365 or any of these sort of things. So there, we're not using an OAuth server. We're just using like a SAML server or some federation server. But that also requires authentication, the same authentication service. So the cookie will flow. So you'll get SSO between your single page application and Office 365 as a bonus. Questions? Yeah. 
questions? More? I could take it all day, guys. We'll talk over lunch if 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 you'd like to also. Mobile apps, great question. Don't, 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 don't do login inside of the mobile app itself. So don't write iOS like Swift code or Java code to do login in the mobile app. Use the system browser. These days they have awesome versions of the system browser, uh, which is like Chrome they call it, uh, Chrome custom tabs and SF Safari web view on um, iOS and those are more integrated with the app. So like with Android especially, you can change the color, you can change the menus, but you still see at least the address bar. You can use your password manager, all this sort of stuff. And in that skimp down browser, you have a shared cookie jar. So if the app opens that up, it can have SSO amongst any mobile app. So you get SSO across mobile applications, plus then you get SSO to the web. So if you got your mobile app and it needs to open up some sort of website to do, I don't know, show part of, of that, like the invoices or some PDFs or something like that. It already gets straight in, so it feels like it's a part of your application, even though it's like a website and a mobile app. Excellent.